Um, it's striking, it struck me as, uh, as I was going, coming along to prepare for this meeting that Humphreys always had good weather. Our founder, he gave tea parties regularly. And whenever he had a tea party, you almost guarantee 100% good weather. It was quite extraordinary. And the other thing about him was on, at his funeral, the, the weather had been quite bleak and, and awful. But on the day of his funeral celebration, well, funeral, it was the brightest of bright blue sky. It was extraordinary. But anyway, here we are, and it's, it's a wonderful thing to welcome you all. And it is a very uh, special occasion. But we have also a very special guest with us today, and that's John Evans, who will be talking about the mandala of the body-mind, realizing original awakening through swordsmanship, shugendo, and shingon. Now, just to say a little bit about John, he's a very distinguished guest. He is in London, someplace distant. Um, he began practicing yoga and tai chi in his teens, and at Oxford University, he trained in karate, and after graduation, went to live in an Anglican monastery. Over five years, he continued studies in Tai Chi, Sanskrit, and yoga. In 1981, went to Japan and began studies in Mikyo, or esoteric Buddhism, and Kenjutsu, swordsmanship, near Mount Takao, on the edge of Tokyo. The Yamabushi, or the mountain ascetics, instruct through a systematic and progressive training in the mountains called Shugendo, the path of training and testing. And after three years, his teacher decided he should focus on swordsmanship as a way of inner cultivation and introduce him to three of the most senior sword teachers in, in Japan. In 1987, his training regime of Kenjutsu, Shugendo was profiled in a 30 minute NTV program, an Englishman's warrior discipline. And in 1992, he, pub he published Trog, a book of poems about Shugendo. And following his return to England in 1993, he founded the Fudokan Dojo in London, where he teaches Batodo and Tanden Tanren, a system of internal and external conditioning. And he received his seventh dan from the International Batodo Federation in Japan in 2008. Now, the reason why I've read all that out is because this is going to be recorded. And I think it's important, although you may know it, but when people uh, come to the recording later who haven't actually seen the blurb, they'll know all about John. But for those of you who haven't read it, that's a sort of rough resume of some things John's done. But I won't take up any more time. There's just something to remember while you're listening to the talk is that you can type in questions for, for John to answer at the end of the talk. The talk will last about 50 minutes after which time uh, John will is, is at our disposal basically to to answer questions until he no longer wishes to do that. <laughs> so can I give a very big welcome to John? Thank you so much uh, with all this new technology and everything. We're incredibly grateful that you've taken it on, and it's a, a real tribute to our founder Christmas Humphreys that, that, you, that with all your training and background, and he'd have been delighted to have met you. You may have done, but um, uh, a very big welcome to the Society on this our Founders Day. Thank you, John. Thank you very much, Desmond. Um, it, is a, it is a great honor to be asked to speak on this occasion. And um, I, when I was in my uh, teens, when I started to get interested in this kind of thing, Christmas Humphreys was an important um, figure in the kind of background. So. Here we are, a number of years later. Um, it's very helpful actually that, that Desmond read out the full blurb because it fills in a bit of background which will help in explaining um, the first part of my talk. Uh, I, I'm, I'm assuming most people are familiar with Vajrayana Buddhism, but just to briefly describe it, it was the the last major flowering of Buddhist philosophy and practice. Originally in India, 
Um, but then it was taken to China and from China it went um, north-ish to Tibet, uh, later Mongolia, and it also went to Japan. Um, there are vestiges of it left in China, but the major centers of that kind of Buddhism are really Tibet and Japan. And Japan's Buddhism or Tantric Buddhism are many, many different schools of Buddhism in Japan, representing all the different Buddhist schools. But the, the, the Vajrayana, the main school, Shingon, went on to develop um, a lot by itself. So there are many similarities with Tibetan Buddhism, but there are also some um, differences. Uh, but essentially, uh, Vajrayana is, um, is a kind of practice, because I think the, the practice is much more important than the philosophy. The practice is based on drawing everything together. So all the kind of energies, all the um, functions within the human being, rather than being anything being uh, suppressed, well, that's probably a bad, a bad word to use, not that schools necessarily suppress it, but that everything that's present can be utilized, can be integrated. And the word Tantra refers to, um, I think your speaker last year, I was watching his, uh, listening to his, his lecture, um, mentioned about the, the warp and the woof. So the way that there is a, a enmeshing or binding together or weaving together of all the different strands of human activity or potential. And um, I thought I would begin by describing an experience I had about 40 years ago, which really um, I've kept going back to over the years and reassessing, even in the week, this week, as I was getting ready to, to, do, to give this talk, I realized a few things about that experience that have not really um, been clear until this point. So, um, as Desmond mentioned in the introduction, I was in an Anglican monastery, but it was a very strange, well, it was the 70s, there were a lot of strange things going on. It was uh, set up by a monk who had been in India a long time and who had studied in great depth the sutras of Patanjali, which is the basic, or basic philosophy of um, yoga practice, or especially meditate, meditative practice. And um, I was allowed very, um, not, not exactly uniquely, but rarely, I was allowed to go out for a, a week to spend some time with some friends from university, all who shared my kind of rough sort of area of interest. And we went to an island called Arran, which some of you may have heard of. Um, in recent years, or the last couple of decades, I have actually done quite a lot of teaching at the retreat center on Holy Isle, which is now, in, now owned by a Tibetan community. Um, but one reason I was attracted to that was because of this experience. So we were, in, we were on the island, we were going to do lots of different kinds of practices and walking. And one particular day, we decided to go to this cave to discover this cave, which had been used for meditation by uh, a very famous hermit. Aaron has a huge number of kind of holy sites and Neolithic sites and caves and um, stones, standing stones. So we set out for this place and it was raining, a kind of very, the kind of rain where you, you, you decide you're going to go anyway because it was very light, but it was a bit misty. The path was very unclear and um, to cut a, a long story short, I had a rough idea. We climbed this hill, I went off to the left. And since I was free from my monastic discipline, I was a little bit sort of carefree, careless. I was jogging and then suddenly I was slipping. And then a moment later I found I was falling through the air. 
Um, so I dropped somewhere between 100 and 150 feet off the edge of this cliff. And um, as soon as I started to drop, my uh, sense of time changed. Most people have had some kind of one of these sorts of peak intense experiences. And the way um, psychologists now, or neurologists, they, what, what they think happens is that there's a huge surge of adrenaline. And the, this starts the, the, the recording system in the memory to become very dense. So it's trying to get all the possible messages of what's going on. And because of this, it apparently, it seems to the conscious mind that this is happening very, very, very slowly. So as I was falling through the air, I could see the cliff. Then I saw the cave. There was a waterfall very close by. It's called Glen Ashdale Falls. I never actually saw it. It was just around the corner. Um, and the, the, the kind of manas, that's what it's called in, in yoga philosophy anyway, the, the sort of processing mind was very slowly, within this very slowed down time, trying to work out what was going on and saying all these kind of banal things. So these phrases were going in my mind, like, I'm falling in air, how can this be? What's happened? There's the cave, kind of stupid sort of banal. And in that moment, I hit the water. So I was in water. Um, again, the mind is trying to, luckily it was water. If I'd fallen 10 meters the other side or five meters, I'd have landed on rock. Um, and a few seconds later, or apparently in, in this kind of time that I was experiencing, about 10 minutes later, I realized I was being swept round in a kind of vortex. So then I realized, yes, I'm now in a whirlpool. So I've fallen 150 feet off a cliff into a whirlpool. Um, and only recently have I worked out with the help of somebody who was there at the time who looked at things in a little bit more clinical way that this mountain stream which is not huge there were a couple of boulders in some storm had got lodged and created this spout so there was a vortex within a quite a small pool but very very powerful and um so as i was going round once twice i get i was got pulled under and uh, a number of things started to separate out. So as I mentioned, as I was falling, there was this banal mind that was trying to process what was going on. But this meant there was another part of my mind that was observing that very calmly. So there was a kind of hysterical, confused character. And then there was this other person looking quietly and obviously the water was very turbulent but i had this sense of some some huge kind of force at work underneath me and then i realized that was my legs so there's this furious kind of treading of water at high speed because i was wearing i had a rucksack on i had boots i had waterproofs so this thing was from the instinctive forces had woken up and was trying to preserve my life. Um, and the third time I had it in my mind, it's a kind of common belief. It's actually not, it has no basis in science, scientific understanding. But the third time I got pulled under, this would be the moment I would die. That was my last chance. And at that point, there was this, uh, like a shriek, that came, I could locate it almost exactly now, like from a little point here, near where the, you know, the physical heart is. Um, this was the recognition that I was losing my pos the possession of my, myself. And then, just as I'd been dragged around that third time to go under, I could see my fingertips and I felt just getting to the edge of the pool, pulling along the surface of the rock. And then it kind of went blank. 
And then the next thing I realized, or when I was conscious, was I was pulling myself out onto this oblong, very thick, thick, flat rock that was set just underneath in front of the cave. Which I found out later, uh, there is some conjecture that this was to do with Neolithic death rites. It just got more and more bizarre. So I crawled out onto this rock, I'm looking up, and then this kind of cry came out of me, which I've had it about three times over 65 years. And it's a sort of, um, it doesn't sound like a human voice. It sounds like some sort of wailing of, I don't know, an archetype or I, um, and then my friends appeared. They'd managed to find a little path around the side. I guess for them it was, they'd been two or three minutes getting down there. Uh, but for me, an awful lot of things had happened. And um, finally, as we were walking back, I had this sense of absolute, clarity is not quite the right word, but absolute um, peace and freedom from all the sorts of obsessive uh, discomforting sorts of things that would be going on in my mind normally most of the time um, so just to kind of review it there was this kind of peaceful overviewing mind which again to use not buddhist terminology yoga terminology the buddhi the insight. Then there was the manas that was trying to process things through the senses, through the normal, uh, normal sort of processes of logic. And then there was this huge, um, powerful, natural force inside the body, the physical vehicle that had its own kind of impelled by its own drives. And then as I was walking away, I, I, the, the peace seemed to be something in the sky. So there was something beyond all of that, which was absolutely quiet, absolutely harmonious, absolutely untouched by any of this little drum. Um, so. I realize now that in, in, doing, in, in, in working with the sword and following through in these practices, there's been an attempt or I've been striving to bring back all of those things or to, to get a full expression of all those things and to bring them all together. So when I went to to Japan. This was after five years in a in a monastery doing all sorts of meditation. And uh, my um, I wasn't intending to study esoteric Buddhism. If anything, I were I had more. I was much more interested in Zen. I'd been very influenced by lots of, as many of my generation in the seventies were, by books about Zen Buddhism. Um, and my studies of literature have been very influenced by and focused on those sorts of things in modern literature. Uh, but in the second week, my second week in Japan, a person I just met recently who had a very Japanese friend who was very connected in, um, in the world of Shingon. His family was a, was, um, was a, a Shingon family going back many, many generations said he had for the first time met somebody who who he thought was not just a theoretician or a kind of um, a career buddhist priest because there is a lot of that in japan um, but a genuine practitioner so he took me to see this man and uh, he uh, he said he was not at all impressed by my tales of having meditated since I was 15. He said, you know, there's no way you can be meditating. Your mind is completely wrong. You're, you're, you're completely stuck in a little part of your brain that you overstimulated at university. And uh, your body is a bag of shit. Um, now I know that the body being a bag of shit 
is actually a technical term in some Buddhist schools. Um, but he was, he was being much more specific in my case. And uh, so he, uh, in the course of the, this conversation, which was all being carried out in Japanese, I was, I, I knew, at that stage I knew almost no Japanese. It was being translated. About 20% was being translated. And it was clear to me that I was being slagged off in all sorts of ways. Um, and uh, nothing good was being said about me. And then finally he handed me this uh, wooden stick and said, uh, well actually before this, he, 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 he opened the back, this kind of living in a kind of a, like a bungalow on the edge of this mountain into this darkness in his backyard set against this cliff, switched on some sort of searchlights brought out a metal sword and started dancing around like a madman with this metal, I don't know, I mean, it could have been, I don't know, it, was, it wasn't sharp, but it looked sharp to me. I thought he'd gone, you know, berserk. Um, and then he, um, he sat down and I was suitably impressed and bewildered. And then he handed me a piece of wood. He said, now you try swinging it. Um, and that was how I started the sword. And uh, he said, I, I, will, I will attempt to teach you some basic ritual. So you, you have some, you, you, you develop some sort of understanding of, of Mikyo. Um, but the main thing for you is to work with the sword. So for about a, a year, I guess, I was working with this. And then he decided that there's really no point in going any further with the ritual because I was not exactly a hopeless case, but certainly extremely ill-prepared. Uh, he said the best thing I could do would be not to read any books for a year um, and just to work on with the body and making objects. So I made a Vajra and, uh, and, uh, and then as Desmond mentioned, Round about the same time, he took me to various sword schools and he said, you know, we work with this. Um, but, for, but I kept doing that very simple ritual. And the rituals of the Vajrayana, as I mentioned at the beginning, are to do with bringing everything together. And the, 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 the way this is done, the skillful means that are used, is referred to as the Sammitsu or the three secrets, which are mudra, mantra, mandala. And the, um, these were all involved in this very simple ritual. And it's a particular ritual which is called the Kujiho or the way of the nine seals. And it has, um, as well as, Buddhist content, it also is derived from Chinese practices, Taoist practices. Um, so it's not really a, in, in a pure Mikyo or Vajrayana practice, but it's a practice of Shugendo, which is the, the mountain ascetics, who share some of these different roots. So this man that was teaching me was completely independent from the main temples. He was independent from the main Shugendo organizations a kind of sort of renegade really. But his teaching was sound. And uh, so for the, the subsequent 30 years, I, I kept practicing this ritual and going deeper into it. So there are nine inke, there's nine hand positions, but they all connect to different things happening inside the body. And they describe a kind of Kundalini practice. Um, but obviously I was a million miles away from any kind of practice like that. The, the mandala is the thing that was 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 hard the most most difficult for me to to grasp because all i was given were were a, was this seven month nine mantras nine hand mudras um 
but there were also nine deities in this particular version of it. So what I'm going to share you with, with you now is uh, an image of this mandala derived from this practice. Is everybody seeing that? Right, okay. So this was painted uh, three or four years ago by one of my students, a very talented artist called Dominika Klimzac. And um, if I, can you all see this cursor? I've made a big cursor, so yeah, that's good. So you'll see here there is a dragon. Uh, there are actually nine dragons here. The, the eight, some of you may be familiar with the, the Nagarajas. Um, they're called the Hachidaibu or the eight, um, the eight dragon kings in, in Japan. Um, and uh, they, they represent within the human body the major key meridians, the major channels of energy. So you have, uh, um, these are not the channels that are used in Chinese medicine, but the channels that are used in the cultivation of, of energy. Um, but obviously, if you put all of the dragons in, then you wouldn't be able to see anything, just be a writhing mass of something or other. But this dragon here shows the sequence of these nine forms, these nine deities. And you'll see here in each of these spheres, there is a, a seed syllable, a bijam. Um, so these are the, these, these are the, the, the in, there are different kinds of mandalas. There are mandalas which are just um, the, sa the invoking sounds, which are the seed syllables. There are mandalas where you see the whole forms of the deities, and there are mandalas where you see their, their implements, which, which um, represent their, um, their functions, their workings, if you like. So these represent those deities. If I can just um, I'm going to look at one, just get one more image. Actually, I think I'll leave that, otherwise we're going to get, to, it's going to, maybe if there's a question and answers, I might bring it up, but the, the if you remember in the, the, the blurb for this talk, the image that was used of Bishamonten, so Bishamonten is, derived from the Indian um, Vaishravana. So a, a Hindu deity, but he was taken on board by the, the Buddhists as one of their four protectors of the directions. So the first one here, this is where we start, is Vishamonten or Vaishravana. And the four on the outside are the four Yang deities and they are the four uh, in in chinese buddhism they are the 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 general the govern the general guardians of the four directions so these are the main gates here so this is north this is east this is west this is south um, for those of you familiar with some of the 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 mandalas of the, the sort of later Buddhist schools. You've got the four elements here. So this is air, water, fire, earth. And these deities here, you've got a yang one and a yin one. They are connected to, or they are manifestations of the, the five Buddhas. So in the center, this is Khan, this is the bijam, or in Sanskrit, hum. This is the invocator for Fudo, Acharanatta, who is the unmoving central deity, who is himself a personification of Mahavarachana or Dainichi Nyorai. So this is the, the core. So we start on this yang, it comes to a yin, to a yang, to a yin. So we've done a figure of eight, and then we come to the center. And then another figure of eight, 
drew this yin one here, yang, yin, finishing on this final one, yang, who is the, the, the guardian, the protector of the southern gate. Uh, so there's a huge amount of material within this mandala, um, but it's all derived basically from this sequence, the nine deities, again in that sequence, and then the, the, uh, their location in the human body, this is derived from the, um, the sister Vastu Shastra, which is the science of, um, a bit like Feng Shui in Chinese, it's the science of architecture or locating things within a building. So, there's a very famous, I think it's called Borobudur, a very famous temple, which is often used to describe the, the most sophisticated form of this, a Buddhist temple. So you have the, uh, these two rep are related to the right shoulder. This is the right shoulder. These two related to the left shoulder. These two to the right leg, these two to the left leg. And then you have this one in the center. And Within this mandala, there are two mandalas. The Shingon system in Shingon Buddhism, the, the, it's the, the whole philosophy, philosophy or the essence of the philosophy is encoded in two mandalas. One is the Vajra mandala and one is the Wu mandala. And there are many different ways in which these are described, but essentially the, the Wu mandala is the mandala of the manifested world of becoming and being and principle and the vajra mandala is the mandala of knowledge or the seer or the uh, um, wisdom now this is very important practically because what i realized from my teacher was that until I was able to access all the all my limbs all the energies inside the body related to the different parts of the brain apart from that particular part that I'd overdeveloped this kind of intellectual part which I think it is a, is a modern sort of disease um, until all of these are cultivated and integrated through this center represented by Fudo, then working with the, the force in the central channel to try and get involved in that Kundalini process is going to be a disaster. Well, it could be a disaster in a number of different ways. You can spend a long time trying to get it and then it doesn't happen at all, or you start and because your body is so imbalanced or your mind is so overdeveloped in certain areas you will get a sort of a sort short circuiting of some kind of um, mental illness or physiological illness so um, the practices that i teach to my students um, is not just swordsmanship um, but is a system of cultivating all of the energies through slow movements and conscious use of the breathing and conscious integration of the center so this whole if you like this whole mandala of the um, human biological form physiological neurological form the whole thing is beginning to work and flow and coordinate and uh, so I've got just a short video which shows some of that kind of practice. Um, the person who put it together, the director, has used some, I think, I'm not sure if it's Tibetan or Mongolian music, so I'm hopefully, hope, hoping it's not too inappropriate.
Marlon, was that all right? Okay. Um, so you'll notice that there's a lot of work in the center, in the core. Um, and I think in some schools describe it as vase breathing. Um, and that really is not just the center physically, but it is the core of the whole process. So when, if we go back to just have a quick look at the mandala again. So in the mandala, the, as I mentioned, you've got the, the, the womb world, um, and then you have the Vajra world. So you'll notice down the center, you have a number of circles and symbols. And these are the, 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 the functions of these nine um, entities in the center central channel. And this process is contained in the external process. So as you come to understand the functioning of the, how the right arm and how it connects to a certain part of the brain, I was unfortunate enough, fortunate enough, about three years ago, I had a, a brain injury. I, I, I um, tripped over our dog and uh, head butted a concrete step. And six weeks later, I began to lose the use of my right arm and leg, which was very disconcerting. But also, it was, it was also very interesting to, to notice some of the changes that started to take place in the way my mind was working. And uh, I think it was a blessing of sorts because I think the, the starvation of the, the, so the right arm, as you probably know, connects to the right side. So the, the swelling, which very slowly grew, was here. So they had to put two holes here to drain it. Um, the pressure and the reduction of the normal functioning of this area slightly, this is my interpretation, really, slightly reduced the, uh, the activity in that side or the preponderance of that side. So I think I'm a, a slightly better person for that experience. It would have been nice to do that without having the brain injury, but it gave me an insight into the the way that the different parts of the brain connect to the different limbs. Um, and uh, one of the few people in this area of the earth that understood that was somebody you may be familiar with, William Blake. So he describes through the body the use, what happens with the right leg and how it connects to a certain parts of the realms inside and in the consciousness. And for most of us um, in the modern world and perhaps more so in, in the Western parts, although that, I think that chain, that difference is becoming much less important. We suffer from being blocked into a very small part of the mind and the, the deeper sides, so we're more in this left side of the brain, we're more on the top, we're more cut off from those forces in the limbic system. So when I was in the, 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 the whirlpool, I, I could not, it would, be, would have been very easy for me to have never actually noticed this huge thing that was taking place underneath me, that was all coming from this lower part of the brain through to the legs, um, because I was so cut off from it. And uh, in the same way, 
these experiences beyond the monus, the monkey mind, that, that these layers that were revealed at that time, it is also so easy to be cut off from them. And the idea of the Vajrayana practices is to fully express all of those things, but in a harmonious, integrated, control is perhaps not the quite the right word, but um, a uh, benevolent manner. Um, I just one one last thing. I, I, I just to make sure that I actually address the title. Um, I was listening to Roy yesterday present one of his sessions on the introduction to Buddhism, and um, he mentioned the in practice. Um, it's very important that you practice with intensity but without obsessiveness. And again, this is something that's very difficult when this part of the brain is in control. If you want the best explanation of it, read the book of Eurism by William Blake. It explains it magnificently, how when this part takes over and starts to distort everything. Um, so to avoid obsessiveness, the way of practicing, you have to, you have to, well, you don't have to do anything, but the, the, the womb world within, the, within this body, within all the faculties, it is fully developed in every body. So when we're practicing, we're trying to make a connection. Well, I've used the word already. You're not trying to build your body. I made that mistake for about 20 years. You are trying to unfold the body. And this is done through the center. Um, and in the, um, a lot of the, the Shugendo rituals end with, a, with something called the Hongaku-san, which is the, the hymn to original awakening. So I thought I'd just read through that. It's quite short and just give a very quick translation of it. Um, so, Kim Yo Hongaku Shinpo Shin, Kim Yo Hongaku Shinpo Shin, Kim Yo means to take refuge, but the, the actual t the words mean to return the life force or return to the life force. Hongaku is the original awakening, and Ho Shin is the Dharmakaya or the, the, the original body of the Buddha or the Dharma essence. So what we're doing is not trying to make something, but to return to something that is present. Joju myoho shinren dai. Joju, joju is like everyday, normal, always living, always present. This thing is always present. Myoho, the wonderful, mysterious dharma. Shinren Dai, or the lotus base in the heart. And my understanding is that this is, there is a mantra for this. This is not the top part of the brain. This is the bottom part of the brain. So if you can release down and allow that part to connect with the, if you like, your spiritual aspiration, then the whole thing can bloom. Honrai gu soku sanjin toku. So this is that the the three bodies. The three bodies are fully equipped. The actual word is like armored. It's the term used in Japan to describe the armor of the samurai. The three bodies. So those of you familiar with uh, the Dharma Kaya, the Samborg Kaya, the Nirmana Kaya, within the body, there are different ways of looking at it. But if it like in the waterfall experience, for example, the Nirmana Kaya was the physical body with all its powers, innate drives and connections through to the natural world was, was what was churning up underneath. 
the Dharmakaya was that thing that was I was connecting to through the in, intuition, which was like a, in the sky. And then the body of enjoyment was me enjoying the waterfall experience. So those three bodies are all complete. You don't have to, um, you don't have to invent them. They are all present, fully equipped. Sanju, Chisanju, Shinjo. The 37 deities of the Vajra world live in the mind castle, the castle of the mind. And this is just something I'm only beginning to have a sl very slight, slight understanding. But the 37 Buddhas inside are to do with the way these mandalas connect. Um, are you still looking at the mandala or am I speaking, Marlon? It's the uh, mandala is still. Oh, is it? <laughs> well, it's probably better to look at the mandala. Really. Okay. How's that? That's better. Okay. Um, Fumon Jinju So the uh, universal, the universal gate. It's not, there's no, nobody's not allowed to enter this place. Through the universal gate, as common as dust, are the innumerable samadhis. So these states of awaken, awakening, of enlightenment, there are many, many kinds of them, and they are fully open to everybody if they're prepared to go through the gate. Onri yinga honengu. Onri yinga honengu. So this means that they are independent of cause, of the world of cause and effect by their very nature. So when I had the waterfall experience, I was a pretty um, obsessed, tormented, repressed character. I mean, you know, not totally unlikable. I had friends. <laughs> But this character, from that experience, at least for three days, was completely free from all of those sorts of karmic influences and um, restrictions. Mu hen tokai honnem man. So this mu hen is boundless, unended, unending. The sea of virtue, the sea of virtue, and the, there is a description of the, the central area as being like the sea of key. So it has a particular kind of resonance with that. Hon M Man, originally perfect and full. You may have noticed that but that form that you saw a little bits of in the video is called the Yofku M Man. The, total fulfillment, completely perfectly full. And then the last line is Genga Chorai Shin Shobutsu. Reverently I salute the Buddhas of the mind. So that's the hymn to original enlightenment. And as I see it, it describes that mandala the way the mandala is, how accessible it is, and the attitude required to enter it or to realize it. So yes, you have to make great effort. Yes, there are many, many challenges. And often it is only the kind of obsessive, messed up characters that have enough um, energy to really get involved in the journey but if you're going to succeed in the journey you have to let go whilst continuing you have to allow the thing to develop so i think that's 
all I've got to say. Are there any, have you found any, any questions? Um. Thank you very much, John. That's the most fascinating talk. There is one question here. There's a couple of questions, actually. The first one um, is, other, other schools of Buddhism speak of overcoming desire, anger, and delusion. How does this work with this psychophysiological system? In other words, it's a moral, it's a kind of moral journey. Can you, could you hear that? I did hear it, yes, yes. Um, um, well, all the, the attitude of the, of the, um, the Vajrayana schools is that those are all energies that can be utilized. Um, so, If you're going to practice to do any kind of a practice, the hardest time to practice is when you you don't have anything moving through the mind. There's no kind of impelling force. So if you're if you have some if you have some kind of aggressive um, if you're disturbed in some way and you're feeling angry about something, especially in Japan, the way they, they talk about the, 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 the great big stomach, which it's not supposed to be a huge stomach, but the, 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 this kind of part of the body is like a kind of um, alchemical vessel. So if you swallow it down and use it, then it can be turned into something else. The same with greed. I mean, for example, um, at the moment, I've got 60 students who are all practicing with a particular form of simple, short form of um, tanren, this conditioning practice to make the abdominal area work. And it's become a little bit competitive because everyone gets a mark. And so if somebody is a third grade black belt and they're sitting there and they notice that somebody who's only been doing, only been in the school for a year, and that doesn't even have a black belt is doing better than them in this practice. It gives rise to all kinds of things. You know, people feel, um, oh, I'd like to do better than them, or why aren't I doing as well as that person? And the whole grading system, the competition system that we use, is a really good example of that, so that it can be used to help um, motivate people. The important thing is where you end up. So you don't feed it, you divert it. Uh, and um, obviously we, I didn't show you, didn't, sh didn't, didn't show any video of the sword, but there is a, <clears throat> a particular thing about the activity of the sword when you do these cutting motions that, um, it's through that act you can free yourself from various mental obstacles. Um, I can give an example of this, perhaps I shouldn't, but anyway, when I was in Japan, I met this very, uh, I was very, as you may have gathered from earlier, very repressed character and um, a virgin until I was very, very, uh, mature and I met this extraordinary woman in Japan who was uh, a painter and a painter's model and a very very beautiful huge incredible kind of energy so we started to get involved I got physically we had a physical relationship um, and it was very sort of passionate um, and then I found out that she was married 
Um, but her husband, who had a job, had given her a separate house where she, should, she, could be, she could pursue her painting. She was having a relationship with her, the painter for which she was usually a model. And then she would bring people to her house, you know, other men who would be kind of become her like her sort of muse. So that was the function I was fulfilling. Um, and when I realized that I was <laughs> speechless and um, she said to me, well, you won't be able to leave me because I have such power over men. There's no way you can possibly. And there was this thing in my mind was saying, you know, especially for me, I've been living like a monk for 35 years. I'm particularly vulnerable. Maybe I won't be able to get out of this. Um, so that evening I went out, set a fire and started doing the sword forms and cutting and cutting. And with each cut, some of that attachment went. And by the end of an hour, I completely felt free, able to just leave, leave that person to their own devices. And so I think that's a pretty good example. <laughs> I think it, it is that because when you were doing those cutting motions, you were completely at one with the, the motion, and therefore you you cut through the attachment because you gave yourself so completely to the I think to those actions, body and mind and your heart. You went completely into it. I, I think that would be the case with you know many other sort of um, physical disciplines, but there's something about the act of cutting with the sword. I mean, it's, it's used as a symbol in many of the, with many of the Buddhist deities for the discriminative power. Mm. Uh, and I, I can't, I mean, I'm, I've got a very strong feeling having done it for so many years, but especially we, because we cut targets. And when you actually cut a target and something separates from something else, there's, there is something about that action Yes, you've used the whole of your body, all your energy, you've been training to bring all of this together. And in that moment where something separates from something else, there is a kind of internal corollary of that. Um, mm. Yeah. Uh, most interesting. Now, there is another question here, John. Um, do you think there's a danger in intensive meditation retreats and traditions that don't have a specific body practice, e.g. unintentional kundalini awakening when one is not ready for them? I don't think there's a danger of unintended kundalini awakening. <laughs> I think there is a danger of something happening which is then conceived of as being a kundalini awakening. Um, so when I, was, um, when I was in the monastery, I was admonished on numerous occasions because I was, my meditation was too um, obsessive. I have this, I mean, my eyes are pretty small and got big bags under them, but I've got this tendency for my eyes to cross. And this arose from, I was looking at the, doing Tratak, looking at the point of light and seeing the light going to until my eyes started to cross and now they they just, they kind of cross and uncross um, despite all my training I'm unable to control it um, and I think those sorts of uh, practices can produce all sorts of distortions but what you won't get is kundalini awakening because to my understanding and insofar as I've been able to touch that the sign of kundalini awaking is of serenity and steadiness and no melodrama and no uh, kind of um, cinematic, fantastic, melodramatic activity inside. Um, but I mean, behind the question, there is, uh, there is another question, which is that, I mean, the path that I have chosen all that was chosen for me is one of working through the body 
arriving at a certain kind of state and then allowing the meditative processes to take place. And I must admit, obviously, I am prejudiced by that. So that's, that would be my prejudice. But that's coming from where I started, because as I said, I was a very repressed character. Um, when I was 10, my father died. When I was 11, my mother had a very severe nervous breakdown. And at the time, the doctors told my brother and I, she may never come out. Two years later, I had a very bad back injury, which left me in pain on and off for 30 years. So I was a very kind of um, distorted character with a very sort of distorted kind of physical structure. So for me, I had no option. I had to resolve all of those sorts of physical things. But I do think there is a danger that if somebody is not sufficiently, if is, is not able to be at ease in their body and connected, and if they then start engaging in all sorts of practices without somebody who understands and who can see what's happening in them supervising, there are all sorts of potential problems. Because mm. I suppose it does release a, an awful lot of psychic energy, doesn't it? Um, <clears throat> I used to teach yoga quite a lot and occasionally people would come up and describe various things that were going on and going back again to that kind of, for me, this, this, this sort of seminal experience, this, this sort of touchstone for me is that what was going on under the water, underneath my center, those kinds of forces are unbelievably powerful. But usually when people in meditation um, kind of short circuit, they're not tapping into those or very, very partially. It's just one little area of the brain playing out its own drama. Again, I, I would say that Blake's The Book of Eurozone is definitely the best textbook for anybody contemplating that kind of journey or somebody who feels that they're beginning to enter some kind of state of distress coming from those sorts of experiences. Mm. Um, unfortunately, it doesn't give you, it just, it just describes the disease. So if you, want to, if you want to understand how Blake saw the way out of all of that, then you have to go into his, his longer prophecies, the four Zoas, Jerusalem, which, which luckily a few people, more people are now beginning to study. Uh, and the reason I keep bringing Blake up is that if you, if you look at Blake's mandala, which is really what he, the four Zoas is, it's the, the five Buddhas, the four Buddhas, the four element mandala, it's, that is exactly what it is. And then if you, if you read what he says about the processes of the imagination and if you like the ontology of these things, that he, he wasn't a madman. He understood how these force forms were taking place and, and being energized. Um, he was a Vajrayana practitioner. I would say he was a very, very advanced Vajrayana practitioner. Um, yeah. Well, there's another question. Thank you very much for that. Um, um, it says, John, which system of karate did you train in and was it the martial arts which got you interested in Buddhism originally? This is from, some, from Thomas Balassi. Well, he probably was a practitioner of Shotokan karate like me because most people in the UK, especially from the 70s and 80s. Um, but I, I was quite, it was a short-lived short-lived um, career because my body was too distorted to cope with all the stresses and strains. I was um, getting ready. There was a very good teacher called Kanazawa and he was coming to the UK. I was training in the Oxford University Club. So I did special training in order to, I hired the hall by myself to do special training. So about two weeks before he, uh, he was due to arrive, I, I could no longer walk. My knees had completely uh, 
that was the end of my karate career. Um, uh, but no, my interest in my interest in Buddhism and in the yoga of the mind predated that. Um, it was actually through a chaplain at school. I'd I'd read about Zen, and he directed me towards the Cowley Fathers, the Society of St. John the Evangelist, and this particular man who'd written a book called Meeting Schools of Oriental Meditation. Um, and that was my interest in, was where my interest in those practices came from. The karate was a few years later. And as I say, short lived because my body was not harmonious enough to cope with it. This is um, another question. I study Goju Ryu in Oxford, where you used to live. Did you also train with Paul Coleman? No, I didn't. Um, but Goju Ryu, Goju means hard, soft. And it's, it's the school of karate which, which has most of this internal, systematic internal training, a bit like some of the stuff I was showing you in that video. Um, but I've never directly trained in that system, but it's something that, it's one of the things I kind of stay in touch with. There was a teacher called Higauna, um, because there's a quality there in the internal work um, and in the connection with the breathing that's um, unusual for Japan. There's another question is, in many of the other schools of Buddhism, there's a fairly strong cognitive element. And that is, to, for example, in Abhidharma, you get to know all the different feelings and emotions, different states of mind and body, and so on, um, from, have, from, from moving from ignorance to understanding. But here you seem to just um, kind of shortcut all that, go straight into the whole physical, living physical experience of, of, of this practice. And I suppose that do those other things just kind of naturally proceed out of the practice without any emphasis on them? Well, I did a huge amount of study of those sorts of things. With, with, with Patanjali, you must have... Yes, um, but <clears throat> I mean, for example, there's an interesting book called The Master and His Emissary by a, a neurologist about the functioning of the left and the right sides of the brain. Gilchrist. Gilchrist, yes. yes. And um, so, for example, in the world of, in the natural world, a predator a predator will always attack from the right side, I think. So the right eye is most connected to the left side of your brain. The left side of your brain is the one which is acquisitive and to do with manipulating and getting things. And that's how that, this arm functions with that part of your mind. And because the right eye is more active in those sorts of functions, it's not as aware of what's going on around. Whereas the left eye with the right side of the brain, which is more observing and intuitive and integrating. So a predator will attack from this side. So what I'm saying is that the the, the, fun the different functions of the mind, of the surface mind, the deep mind, the instinctual mind, are within the limbs. So when you're, when you, for example, when, we, when, when using the sword, there is a, um, an expression, tenuchi. So tenuchi means the world inside the hands. It just literally means inside the hands. But the way in which you communicate with the sword, the left hand is the one that generates the power and the right hand is the observing function. It's kind of 
adjusting the balance and making sure that the pathway is true. The way that you use the hand, these are, the, these are linked to the elements. So this is, the little finger is linked to the element, earth, water, fire, air, ether, space. This is called the dragon's mouth. Yeah. And this is to do with all the, the mental spiritual functions. But the connection to the, it, you know, the, this sort of, the beast, the kind of huge natural power of the, of the instinctive part is through that little finger. So when you're, you're, you're manipulating the hand and adjusting how you communicate with the sword, you are adjusting all those functions. Um, and <clears throat> the cognitive, I mean, the, lots of those cognitive functions and the, the fine analysis of those cognitive functions to me seems to be a hugely disproportionate amount of attention given to something already overdeveloped when all of those other parts unconsciously are having an influence on you. So for example, in, in the in cutter practice, in forms practice, the idea is that you start in a state of absolute serenity. And within three seconds, you waken up all of those different powers to be involved in this hugely, from external perspective, aggressive act of killing. And at the end, you are then immediately within three seconds, you come back to that state of absolute poise. And so as you go through this, if you like, this narrative, this journey, you are awakening and directing all of the different layers of the mind and bringing together, you're practicing your, your um, connection to all of the roots of being. This seems to me more profitable than a huge analysis of things that are taking place in a particular part of your brain. Mm. That's, a, that's the most interesting answer. That seems, you know, you probably are aware that, um, you know, in the treatment of, of depression, which can't be treated through ordinary psychotropic drugs, they, they use things like psilocybin and psychedelics. And they've noticed one of the reasons for the people feeling so much better is that all the areas of the brain become activated during, you know, the treatment. Yes. So the whole brain becomes alive and you seem to be describing, you know, the fact that, you know, going from absolute calm to the point of actually being capable of killing someone with your, or just, you know, doing something so violent and so, um, and requiring the whole of all your, all areas of yourself, that's a similar kind of thing is going on. And, and as you say, we, we only live in a tiny little bit of our minds most of the time, and the rest brain is just asleep. Well, I think that's very true. And th there's one of the practices I've done quite a lot of over the years is waterfall training. Um, but any kind of like cold water immersion, this has also been shown to have a huge, be hugely um, beneficial for people who've got, um, who have mental illness. Um, and uh, when I was in the Anglican monastery, I remember our priest, Abbot, talking about this French priest who had just been imprisoned because he was using cold water therapy to treat people with mental illness. I mean, maybe he was using it inappropriately, but um, it's a very powerful thing to just wake up all of the surface area of the body. Um, Yeah. It's interesting because the, um, sorry, just to add to that, the, um, there's a thing called the diving reflex. So when the, the, the face, especially this area of the face is exposed to cold water, it triggers the vagus nerve 
um, which is the, the nerve which, is the, the, which controls the parasympathetic nervous system. So that's the, the part of the nervous system um, which works in tandem with the sympathetic nervous system. So you have the fight or flight, and then you have the calm and recuperate, these two functions. And when you are in a very cold water environment, the, um, the body draws the blood very particularly towards the brain because the brain, if it loses the, um, the brain cells are not able to, to regenerate after they've been exposed to cold. So the, the, there's a very particular kind of effect in the brain as well as this full opening up of the body. And I think this is one of the reasons why the, the waterfall training and the cold water immersion has a beneficial effect on the mind. It triggers this kind of um, recuperative, uh, calming part of the nervous system. Hmm. You, you still have the, the water now in the taps is about 12 degrees. It's going up. So if you want to try this, you need to try it in the next few weeks before it starts to get too warm. So would you recommend what between zero and five degrees? The best thing is to is to start with you know to start with sort of ten degrees, twelve degrees. Um, the easiest way is you have a hot shower, and then you turn on the cold shower and you just put it down your right arm. You start with the right side, right arm, left arm, right leg, left leg. Then you try to put it on, on, on your back, um, but you leave the head till last. And slowly you get used, you get used to it. Yeah. Now, there's another question here. Uh, what method would you advise for health workers and people on the front line in the COVID situation? What do you think could help? Well, the thing with people who are under that intense pressure and they're, and they're required you know, to do long, long shifts, they don't have time to do anything um, which requires a lot of time or a lot of energy. Um, I think the cold, the, cold, the cold water is something. You have a hot shower and then the cold water. Um, it's very difficult. I mean, I had, I had a friend who was on oxygen and um, I noticed there was some various breathing techniques being uh, going viral on YouTube. And some of them are very inappropriate because it really depends on what's happening with that person. So the, the, even if the lungs are the main area that you are trying to deal with difficulty in the lungs, for example, asthmatics, people who have asthma, if they try to, they feel they can't breathe enough, if they start to take deeper breaths, it can bring on a fatal asthmatic attack. So if somebody is, um, somebody is distressed or has a, uh, a tendency to become mentally agitated, then those kinds of breathing techniques are very dodgy. Yeah. But there's a way to the abdominal breathing is the best, but it's, it's, it's not something that you can teach very easily. Um, so it's very hard to give, to give advice for those people. Um, they need to rest, that's the most thing you need to rest, but they need, there needs to be some way to calm down the nervous system because they're being exposed to trauma over and over again. And a lot of those people will need lots and lots of, um, will need a number of years to get over it. Hmm. I think that's true. There's a question here, which I, I hope I'm getting it right. Um, is it talking again about, the co about COVID? You have to allow to let go to develop. Could you, John, develop the idea a bit further? from Olivia Pitier. Um, 
you have to allow the body to heal itself. So if you get distressed, the ability to stay calm, if you, if you have some sort of training where you, you're able to connect with the, the tanden or the, you know, the, you can breathe and relax, then that allows the body to do its job. Um, that's what I mean. Mm. Well, we've, we've probably taken up a huge amount of your time, John, but there is one last question. Actually, there's two more just come up. Have you time for a couple more questions? Two more questions and the dog will need to go for a walk. <laughs> <laughs> yes, We've got to keep our feet on the ground. <laughs> yes. um, thank you for your talk. And what is the purpose of the small white ball in your, ta in your tanran? And I'm not sure what that refers to, from Daniel Morris. Daniel oh, that's, that's a, that, that movement, so I'm holding a ball and I do this kind of motion. It's called the dragon, the dragon serves tea. Mm. So it was a practice where they would, they would hold a cup of water and then they would take this all the way around and bring it around and they, they weren't allowed to spill the tea. But having some weight there, just increases the intensity of the exercise. Yeah. Um, but uh, yeah, it doesn't need to be much, just a small weight, like a can of beans. Um, yes. What's the last one? Dave? Yes, I'm just looking at it. Um, Yeah. Do you recommend, can you recommend a very simple practice that we could do in our homes during lockdown? No. <laughs> That's a bit on the levitation level. <laughs> um, I'm not, my insurance doesn't cover this, that kind of uh, answer. I'm, 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 I'm insured through a kind of martial arts organization. And it was very interesting, their response to the, uh, to this present crisis, which was to say to all the teachers that you're, you can teach online, but only to students you've already taught. And uh, the truth behind that is that you, can't, you cannot give a practice to somebody without knowing who they are, what they are, how they're going to use it. Um, so it would be inappropriate to do that. Um, but if your if your um, interest is genuine, you will find a practice. And the important thing is to do it in the way I described at the end, which is to do it so that you're not driven. You're dry, You're not being driven to do the practice. You are doing the practice. You have motivation, but you are observing the result of the practice. And you do the same thing every day and slowly develop it. And in that way, if you are doing something that's not quite right, you will notice and you'll know you have to modify it. Or this thing isn't working, I have to drop this. The worst thing you can do is to take up one thing now, something in a three days time, try that, try the other, because there's nothing accumulating, there's no understanding accumulating of how you work with your vehicle. Thank you. I think that sort of brings us to the end, but there is somebody who's asked, uh, if we want to do more, you know, how do we, along the lines that you're suggesting, would that be to contact you at your, at your center? Yes. I mean, yeah, we're waiting for the, <laughs> waiting for the lockdown to be, uh, to move through its phases mm. so that we can start regular classes again. And would there be a book that you could suggest to people wanted to? Well, I wrote a book called Kudikara, which talks about the, the, the sword practices, but also the Tanbran practice. I mean, that would be a useful way to, 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 to get a little bit more familiar with the terminology and the process. Um, Kudikara. Kudikara. Good. Well, I think that brings us to the end. And I think that was... And I'd like to thank on behalf of the audience, of everyone here, for a really wonderful, inspiring talk on this special Founders Day 
anniversary. It really was inspiring, John, and made it give us a lot to think about. And it makes one really aware of of the body and how, how much we neglect it and how much we really need to put it into the practice, the whole body, and not just the mind thinking about it. So that's been, been a wonderful spur, to, I'm sure, to most of us. And thank you very, very much. And perhaps you could come and talk to us again sometime. It'd be very nice if you could. In the flesh. Yes, in the, in, in the flesh. Yes. Well, thank you very much, Desmond. It's been a um, pleasure. Thank you. Yeah, it's been a great pleasure for us too. Thank you so much. Thank you so much.